<clears throat> We're about to begin our Bible study in Ephesians 5-2 this morning, but before we begin, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1, 9 tells us, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish us out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. We're praying for the men and women of our military around the world who are fighting for that freedom. We pray you build them up, encourage them, protect them, enable them to neutralize our enemies wherever they may exist. We pray for our policemen and women here inside America that you would encourage them and protect them, enable them to apprehend the criminals who seek to destroy our freedom stateside. We pray for our leadership in America that you would continue to raise up men who could guide our country by its constitution and thereby protect our freedom. We pray for the people of Korea and the people of Ukraine. Father, we pray for Israel, <clears throat> especially her military, that you would enable them to win their freedom and that Israel might have peace. We pray for our friends in the Philippines, Father, the ones who are in ministry. We pray that you would enable them to carry your word wherever it's wanted. For our friends on the prayer list that are sick, we pray that you would heal them, whether it be by medicine or miracle. For our friends who are in pain, we pray that you would relieve their pain, remind them of your grace, which is sufficient. For our friends who've lost loved ones, Father, we pray you be with them in their grief, remind them of your precious promises, which brings the peace that passes all understanding. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're studying out of Ephesians 5, 2. I want to read it again in my New King James. It says this, And walk in love, and that is in the sphere of love. We know it's the love complex or divine dinosphere. Where the relaxed mental attitude is the attitude of the day. And that virtue love is the highest Christian virtue, walk in the sphere of love, it says, as Christ also, so we have Christ and he prototyped this love for us, in other words, he lived it here on earth, we have a great example, and we're going to get an illustration of this love, it is sacrifice, as Christ also loved us and given himself for us as our as our substitute in other words what we really deserve was to be a pile of burnt ash but instead Christ took our place he took our judgment and he received the penalty for sin so his love for us and this is his virtue love promoted the sacrifice. The sacrifice has an effect. And what is that effect? An offering and sacrifice to God, that's God the Father, for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, we saw last week that a sweet-smelling aroma is an anthropomorphism that is used to describe propitiation or the satisfaction of God the Father's righteousness. I wanted to uh, share just something with you real quick because I did um, use my Blue Letter Bible to just search sweet savor, which is the way the word is used in the King James Version. It was, it's used this way 88 times. And um, so 
it is a reoccurring theme. And this phrase, since it's used 88 times, we know that in 88 different instances, God the Father is satisfied with the work of Christ. It is a sweet-smelling aroma or savor to Him. And in the Hebrew here, we have Nehoa Rea, sweet savor. And so that was an interesting uh, search there. And uh, I encourage you to use the Blue Letter Bible as you... Um, I use it quite often because I think of a phrase, but I can't think of the book or the number that the verse is in. So I just put a couple of words in there and bam, it'll pull it up for you. We're going to go back to our PowerPoint. And the sweet aroma or sweet savor points back to the Levitical offerings. And last week I showed you uh, something about the um, tabernacle and we saw how the uh, Israelis uh, camped out and they followed the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day and where it stopped is where they camped and this is what their encampment looked like. The tabernacle right in the middle. We saw that the uh, tabernacle was had a courtyard and that there was only one gate. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. The offerings that we're studying, the Levitical offerings, are heavy on the brazen altar. And this is what the brazen altar looked like. And we noted last week that some of the offerings were burned completely all the way to ash. And then uh, some of them were not. And we're going to look at some more of them today. This may be what the bronze labor looked like. We're not real sure how big it was, but this is a good example because... God said, use everything you have. That was the last thing they built out of all the different metals that were brought in um, as gifts. And they, he, God told the artisans, Bezalel and Aholiab, use the rest of the material to build the bronze labor. And it represented the extent of God's forgiveness. So it was absolutely huge. We began to look at the uh, Levitical offerings, and I want to come back to a summary of the Levitical offerings and give you a little bit more meat to put on the bones here. We're going to see in the first category of Levitical offerings is the burnt offering. And there are three different subcategories under the burnt offering. First, the herd. Secondly, the flock. And then thirdly, the fowl. The second category of offerings was the gift offerings. It's a bread offering. And it, it has three categories. First, the one that came from the oven, the second one that came from the pan, and the third one that came from the frying pan. And every time I see that one that came from the frying pan, I remember my great-grandfather and that he used hot water cornbread, and that was his uh, thing. And uh, my grandma, she had the best food in the world, came out of a kitchen that was sloped like this because the house was falling in, but... She made that hot water cornbread, and there was a story about my great-grandfather. He came to dinner, and uh, my grandma Horton didn't have time to make the hot water cornbread, and he, he just stuck his lip out and said, I'm not eating. 
of course he he I never met him because he 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 died. I don't know how old he was when he died, but it may have been the hot water cornbread that got him. It wasn't really hot water. It was grease that they cooked <laughs> that in. So the frying pan offering. The third category was the peace offering. All three of the first are related to salvation. You'll see those. And then the second uh, category are the rebound offerings. They're the sin and the trespass offering. Both of those are phase two or uh, believer or rebound type offerings. Same as 1 John 1, 9 for us. So, you had the offerings of the feast days, which were different. The Day of Atonement, uh, the Year of Jubilee. You had all of those offerings which were different and commanded by the Mosaic Law. These Levitical offerings are separate. And they taught grace. They taught the issue of grace. The other offerings, God said, do it or else. You better uh, recognize the Sabbath. And the Sabbath year was to be recognized in Israel. And then every 50 years they had a year of Jubilee. And they were to plant no crops. And they, they had to rely on a, uh, a crop that would spring up from last year's seed to make it. And it was a memorial to God's grace. But see, those were commanded. These were grace, and ever in every instance of the Levitical offerings, we're going to see the grace of God directed towards man. Now I want to continue teaching. We begin looking at <clears throat> the herd uh, category from the burnt offering last week, and I want to pick it up again and put some more meat on it. It, we see it from Leviticus 1, 3 through 9. If his offering, that is the believer from Israel, from the word Corban, be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. Now this was going to be a bull. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And so we see this was, um, this was a very costly sacrifice because animals were a lot of the currency of the day. And a bull would be a very expensive animal. And so we're going to see that from the burnt offerings, you had the rich guy, and his offering would have been the bull. You had the middle class guy, and his offering would have been a sheep or a goat. And then you had the poorest of the poor, and their offering would have been a dove or a pigeon. And so God made allowance for everyone to make an offering. The Hebrew noun olah, means ascent or holocaust or burnt sacrifice. It is taken from the verb hala, to go up in smoke or flame. Hence it refers to the gaseous smoke which curled upward after the carcass was consumed by the flames. This sweet savor was said to propitiate God the Father. And so you see our verse points directly to this offering, the burnt offering. The offering was taken from the herd specified a male without blemish. Thus it represented the incarnate person, perfect person of the Son of God. As God, Jesus Christ possesses the same divine attributes as God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, as deity, Christ could not go to the cross as sin bearer for mankind. Sovereignty is not subject to death. Perfect righteousness cannot have contact with sin. 
And perfect justice must condemn sin wherever it is found. Eternal life can neither die spiritually nor physically, nor can omnipresence reduce itself to one geographical spot on the cross. Omnipotence cancels out the power and limitations of death, and immutability and veracity preclude any change in Christ's essence. In short, because it was impossible for God to die upon the cross, it was imperative that Jesus Christ become a true member of the human race, yet to be without blemish. He must be born without a sin nature. And so the bull offering, there's the beginning of the uh, representation of the offering and that the bull had to be without any flaws and uh, Jesus Christ was flawless. Anybody who's farmed knows you want to call your bad animals and keep the good ones. And so a farmer to pick the best of his herd, a flawless male to bring it for sacrifice, this was a, uh, a really huge endeavor. And... Uh, we're going to find out it absolutely had to be flawless. And they were going to check to make sure that it was flawless before it was put upon the grate of the brazen altar. And if somebody brought a flawed animal, a sick one, it was rejected and it was not used. And so uh, this really made the offerer think about God, uh, Christ and his perfection. It goes on and says, He shall offer it, that is the offering. This is the believer approaching God. This time, Korab is in the Hiphil imperfect and should be translated, He shall be caused to approach God by his own voluntary will. The ritual is for the believer and Jesus Christ. But he must know the significance of what he is doing. He must do it from his own free will. Ritual without reality is meaningless. The Bible recognizes both human and divine volition, yet God never coerces human volition. Now, this is important in your giving also, and uh, it would be easy for me to uh, promote giving by showing you pictures of dirty kids overseas and say, look at these kids over here. They're emaciated, and they're starving, and, and what did you eat for breakfast or whatever, you know? These guys will really get a hold of your emotions and try to wring your pockets books out. And uh, it is, it's against God's policy. He does not coerce man to give. It must be of your own free will to do it correctly. To, be, to have the right motivation is re in response to grace. And uh, so ritual without reality is meaningless. Jesus Christ also went to the cross of his own free will. He prayed, not my own will, but thine be done, remember? Propitiation would have been impossible apart from the positive volition of the humanity of Christ. Matthew 26, 39, Matthew 26, 42, Hebrews 10, 7. Then, to be compatible with the grace of God, man must in turn demonstrate voluntary response, response to appropriate salvation. Jesus Christ has provided salvation in total. He is the object of our faith, John 20, 31, Acts 16, 31. And the object of faith, never the subject, at all, has all the merit. 
So we see the Jewish believer who brought the offering from his herd of his own free will to the door of the tabernacle was expressing positive volition towards the Savior. There the animal would be sacrificed in the sinner's place to foreshadow, foreshadow that the perfect sacrifice of God's own Lamb. I love uh, to see fine bulls, and they have really uh, brought uh, the genetics of uh, breeding bulls around. And if you uh, tour around to some of the nicer farms, you'll see some of these bulls. And... Um, I'll never forget the uh, fight that uh, my dad caused by bringing home a bull one time that uh, he didn't ask uh, how the money, he just showed up and he, he his policy was it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission, I guess. But he had a, uh, a he, he went, he, I don't know where he got it, a Hereford bull. And... Uh, this thing had a couple of extra vertebrae, man. He was long, <laughs> and he was wide, and uh, he was raised right to because he was just as friendly, and you could go up and pet him and brush him, and uh, my mom saw that bull standing out in the pasture. Well, how much was that? <laughs> well, it was real expensive. But uh, the good news is he just used it for breeding purposes and then resold it a while later. But I couldn't imagine him taking that bull and giving it away. And yet that was the cost of a sacrifice uh, for an Israeli. So this was a, a very intense thing Um to give from the herd a perfect specimen. It goes on and says, And he, the believer making the animal sacrifice, shall put, as a cow perfect of Samach, his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him on behalf of him to make atonement for him. What transpired at the brazen altar was symbolic transfer of the person's sins to the innocent animal. As the offerer's hand was placed on the animal's head, it, was, it represented the transfer of his sins to the coming Messiah. The laying on of hands was identification. The sins of the man were identified with the animal to be slain. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it tells us, He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. By the way, in Hebrews, it tells us that the laying on of hands, which there are three different kinds in the Bible, is a basic doctrine which shouldn't have to be reviewed. We ought to all know it off the top of our head. And this is one of the categories, the Levitical offerings, where the offerer was to lay his hands upon the bull, signifying the transfer of his sins to Christ. We've already seen that fire speaks of judgment, and here it refers to Christ who was judged for us. The sweet savor in Leviticus 1.9 is literally the sweet smell of our verse, Ephesians 5.2, and it indicates that God is satisfied with the work of His Son. That means propitiation, the satisfaction of God the Father's perfect righteousness.
What is amazing about this sacrifice is the fact that it was burned in total uh, except for the hide. And uh, that no one partook of the meat of this animal. It was burnt to ash completely. And so um, while the priest did get to take part uh, of some of the other, other offerings, partake of them, um, the burnt offering was burnt up. And this meant that Jesus Christ offered himself wholly for the sin debt and that every sin of the human race, past, present, and future, was judged in his body on the wood completely and thoroughly and that God will never mention your sins or mine when you get to heaven because ash, it, it's judged, it's gone. The next section of the burnt offering is from the flocks. We saw that the bullock or bull delineated propitiation in the greatest detail. So there was a big section there that told us how the bull offering was to go. This next section of the flocks is, is going to be much more abbreviated. There was a necessity of the certain overlap in the symbolism of the other burnt offerings, for these also pictured the person and work of our Lord. As the Jews learned by repetition, so was, must we. So the flock offering also taught that there was only one way for sinful man to enter in a personal and eternal relationship with God. That is John 14, 6, Acts 4, 12. And that God's satisfaction demands a perfect sacrifice. It goes on and tells us in Leviticus 1.10, And if his offering, Korban, be of the flocks, that's namely of the sheep or of the goats, for a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring it a male without blemish. So this was not as expensive and more approachable for some who did not own cattle, not everyone had cattle of that day. The cattle was the most expensive animal, and the sheep or goats was a probably a lot more common herd animal at the time. The third category of burnt offering was the fowls. It would be a bird. It's seen in Leviticus 1, 14 through 7. There's a principle here. The teaching of Bible doctrine must always be available to all believers, regardless of background. Only the object lessons vary. While all Israel might watch and learn from the sacrifice brought from another, a personal offering was required from all Jewish believers. The offering category applicable to the poor specified that they bring either a dove or a pigeon. In Leviticus 1.14 it tells us, and the, if the burnt sacrifice for his offering to the Lord be of fowls, or birds, then he shall bring it, bring his offering of turtle doves or of young pigeons. Now each one of these offerings was carried out in a different manner, and there was a different aspect of teaching about salvation in each. The end result of all of the burnt offerings was the sweet savor unto God the Father. God the Father is satisfied. The dove represented the deity of Messiah, but since it was brought in as a sacrifice, more than his deity was in view. This is a reminder that Christ would be the unique person of the universe, the God-man Savior. 
While all members of the Godhead are co-equal and co-eternal, it was the Father who planned the redemption of mankind. But the Son executed the plan. The Son would be different from God the Father, different from God the Holy Spirit, because He would also be man. He would be different from man in that He was also God and perfect man in the hypostatic union. The dove then taught the doctrine of the hypostatic union. It is interesting that the poorest of the poor brought that which represented the greatest in the Savior. Therefore, the bringing of the dove became the symbol of God's grace and salvation. In 2 Corinthians 8 9, it says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, being rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That's the cross that ye through his poverty might be rich. The gentle disposition and cleanliness of the dove made it a type of Christ in the scriptures. But its use in both the burnt offering and the sin offering anticipated Christ's resurrection. Once his mission was accomplished, resurrection followed. So while they had these rituals in Israel and they were teaching aids, we have the reality of Bible doctrine. We have the historical event that took place and we have the New Testament scriptures which outline the next section of Levitical offerings are the gift offerings. The gift offerings are all bread offerings. If you're reading a King James Bible, it's going to tell you meat. But meat is translated from gift or food. And while part of this one was burned up, part of it was given to the priest. First of all, there was the, in the gift offerings... There was the oven offering. Different types of cooking units were used in each of these. The pan offering and the frying pan offering. So we're looking at the second category of Levitical offerings and we have three subcategories, the oven, the pan, and the frying pan. Obviously, each one is going to teach us a, a different doctrine, different aspect. So let's look at the significance of the gift offering. And he, that is the offerer, shall be caused to bring it, that is come in, the hip hill, perfect of bow. That's the same word used for the wedding when Jesus Christ walked Eve down the aisle, bow to present. To Aaron's sons, the priest, and he, the offerer, shall take, that's a cow perfect of kamats, to take with a hand, therefore his handful of the flour, and thereof of the oil thereof, and with all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn it, as a memorial upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. There's your phrase again, sweet savor, Leviticus 2.2. 2. And the remnant of the meat offering, that is bread or gift offering, minka, shall be Aaron's and his sons. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire, Leviticus 2.3. So when this one was not fully consumed, only part of it, a handful, was thrown on the brazen altar and the rest was consumed by 
the priest, Aaron and his sons, the Levitical priesthood. What is the teaching here then, Brad? Well, you're going to love this. Watch what happened. While the Levitical priesthood was highly specialized, you had to be from a descendant of Aaron, and you had to be perfect. You couldn't have any flaw. You had to be a male, and you, you couldn't be missing any fingers. You couldn't have any uh, defects uh, of your body. You had to, because it was a representation of the, our high priest Christ, and uh, it, it was very specialized. There were not many of the Israelis were in the Levitical priesthood. Our priesthood is universal. That is, every believer is a priest and an ambassador. They received a portion of the gift offering man had brought. What's the analogy? We receive a double portion of the gracious gift of God. Jesus Christ enucleated this truth when he said, Ye in me and I in you, in John 14, 20. What did that mean? Ye and me, that's the baptism of the Spirit, where we're in union with Christ. Only in the church age, every believer is right there in that top circle. And then I in you, that means that Jesus Christ is indwelling every believer in the church age. Jesus Christ is our royal high priest, since we share his priesthood, we are a kingdom of royal priests. It's only fitting that we partake of a royal food. Now wait, see, Aaron and his sons, they got to eat of the gift offering, didn't they? It was an offering brought in. It was oil and flour and frankincense. It was spice. And they ate of the bread. We eat of the bread. The manna. What is the manna that we eat? The spiritual food is the noble doctrine, Hebrews 6, 5. It is God's intention that the believer priest be sustained spiritually. You see, Aaron and his sons, they were commanded not to have a job. Do not work a job is what God told Aaron and his sons, your job is to teach doctrine. Don't you dare go out and get a tent-making job. Don't you dare go out and invest in the stock market. Don't you dare go out and try to make any other money. Your job is to teach doctrine. And when the people received that good doctrine, they responded by bringing offerings. You see, there was a response. So that when Aaron and his sons taught doctrine correctly, people brought offerings in and they ate. So the emphasis was in teaching good and true doctrine from the Levitical priesthood so that there was a response on the behalf of the people to bring an offering in. If they taught bad doctrine, guess what? That old... That old robe with that rope around it start getting getting a little loose, a little gant in the waistline, a little skinny. And what did they have to do to be able to get people to respond? They had to study. They had to bear down. They had to study the Scripture. They had to teach the doctrine. And they had to uh, let the doctrine be known. And those who understood it would respond with a grace gift back unto them, see. Well, believers in the church age are also royal priests. That's the reason I wore purple. You're all royal priests. And God has given us something to eat from the altar from. Bible doctrine. Are you a little thin in the waistline in your spiritual life? Most believers are emaciated. No doctrine. All ritual without reality. They're starving to death. They put on a superficial facade of happiness. How are you doing? 
Oh, I'm doing great. And on the inside, crushed. Life is just crushing them. Got no happiness, no desire even to keep on living. Crushed by life. What do you need? Bible doctrine in your soul. The sustenance, the sustenance that comes from God. The manna from heaven. The perfect food. Jesus says, I communicate these things unto you that my joy, that is the happiness is, might be in you. When you have Bible doctrine in your soul and you go out into life, which is hard, life is hard, you find that the pressures of life are just another opportunity to flex your spiritual muscle that you gain from what? Eating doctrine. When you don't have any doctrine, the pressures of life crush. They become inward stress. So what's the point? Believers need doctrine. They don't need ritual without reality. They're starving to death out here. They're emaciated because they reject the manna from heaven. You say, well, how do we get them in here to learn some doctrine, Brad? Let them see the power of the Word of God in your life. Let them see you not squirm under pressure. Let them see you praise and glorify God when you're going through tests. Why is it that you don't whine and complain? And I work with a bunch of men. I guess they were raised by women. They bellyache at the slightest hint of any adversity. And I took, I took some, my father taught me a few things when I was growing up. And I was glad to be raised by a man. One of the principles he taught us was the fact that when, when tough times show up, the tough get going. No step for a high stepper. And those who have the bread of doctrine have the strength to carry on. Not only that, you become the salt, the preservative of your nation and a light unto men. And I hate it that hardship is coming to the United States. We're dwindling and, and hard times are coming. And uh, the Bible says, uh, how weak are you that stumble that that they're frail under testing. They fail under testing. Bible, so he provided the gift of Bible doctrine, which develops category one love, that is for God. Knowledge and application of Bible doctrine is the only means of reaching super grace. Well, I couldn't uh, emphasize more the the. The point is to reach super grace before catastrophe. It's only the super grace believers which will be delivered by God in times of catastrophe. The Bible says, uh, Woe unto the warrior who trusts in his horse. It will not deliver him in time of battle. Woe unto the warrior who trusts his sword. He, he, will, he will not be delivered in time of battle. But it says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And God will direct his ways. See, that's the answer for hard times that are coming. Super grace status. Be part of the pivot. And while Jeremiah got thrown down a well uh, during the invasion of Israel and all his friends got killed in the street uh, later he was pulled out of the well and he lived and it doesn't mean that he wasn't uncomfortable for a period of time but God delivered him 
as a super grace believer while his generation lay dead in the streets. So God delivers his people. And so it's for us to eat the bread of doctrine while there is time. See, while there be time. And the writer of Hebrews says this, if there be time. Remember that. That was just three years before they ran out of time, by the way, in 70 A.D. All right, we'll take a break right here. Keep on going in Levitical offerings. Thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be matured, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself an approved workman unto God who needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth, we're looking at Ephesians 5, 2, which it says Jesus Christ, in his love, offered himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God the Father for a sweet-smelling aroma. And this is a direct um, application from the Levitical offerings. We've been looking at them. We've seen that there are five different categories where you're I <clears throat> looked at the burnt offering and the subcategories of the herd, flock, and fowl. Secondly, we have seen the gift offerings. We really haven't covered in detail the different subcategories. There is the oven offering, the pan, and the frying pan offering. I do want to give you one more application of doctrine from this teaching, and it has to do with the sweet-smelling savor. We've seen the application of the smoke ascending and the smell of the sacrifice being a sweet savor unto God the Father. In other words, the satisfaction of his righteous demands in judgment for sin. There's another application that's secondary. I want to share it with you. Under sweet savor unto God. To, f to see the full significance of the repetition of this phrase, we must interpret the Bible in keeping with the customs of the time which was written. In the ancient world, a sweet smell was idiomatic for acceptance. G road conditions were often deplorable. Refuse was thrown into the streets or onto the streets, right into the paths of pedestrians. To arrive at one's own home or any house of one's host with dirty feet was practically unavoidable. Hence, the customary greeting of the time was not come in, but wash your feet. Uh, we used to say, off with the shoes, you know. Well, we don't wear shoes inside. Just inside the gateway was a small pool where this was done. In wealthy homes, servants were in attendance at the pool. Upon entering the hall, the guest was sprinkled with some aromatic essence of flowers, perfume, or incense. Just to cut the road film off. This indicated that he was acceptable to his host and gladly received. It is equally unavoidable for the believer to walk through life without the defilement of sin. If our righteousnesses, righteousnesses are a stench to God, how much worse are our sins? In other words, if our good, human good, are repugnant to God, how much worse then are our sins? There was only one who was totally acceptable to God the Father, that is Jesus Christ. 
He alone could say, I do always those things that please him, as in John 8, 29. As so, as the entire sheep or goat corban offering, his skin accepted, was consumed in the flames, its gaseous smoke ascended heavenward for the perfect picture of Christ, who hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling savor. That's our verse, Ephesians 5.2. And him and through him we have become acceptable to God. And so um, these Levitical offerings are a tough study. I do want to try to keep it plain by keeping these categorized for you. We've taken a look at so far the burnt offering, which came in three subcategories. The herd, which was normally a bull. The flock, which was either a male, sheep, or goat. The fowl, which was either a dove or a pigeon. We have looked, uh, began to look at the gift offering, which was a bread or food offering. It had three ingredients. It had fine flour, oil, and frankincense. It was developed or cooked in three different manners, from the oven, from the pan, or the frying pan. Each three of these taught a different doctrine. We're going to go on to see the peace offering, which is the offering of reconciliation between God and man. And then the, se the last two categories are phase two offerings, rebound offerings, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. Well, I want you to see this morning in conclusion the fact that Jesus Christ was a gift from God and... Uh, one of the most arrogant things that we could ever think is that we're not worthy. That we are not worthy somehow. Because while salvation is a gift to us, it did not come free. And while the Israeli brought the bull offering in, he was obviously reminded of the cost of this offering that he was giving. It was also symbolic of the price that God gave to purchase us from the slave market of sin. And he did not pay a cheap price. He paid the most expensive price that could be paid, the offering of his uniquely born son in our stead and so while we receive salvation free absolutely free gift from god it demands a response it demands a response and what is that response from us it is a life of honor towards god and when we see when we remember we bring into remembrance that sacrifice on our behalf. We can exist in a state of honor. Well, this reminds all of us that we are worthy because God paid the most for us, the most that he could pay. And none of us can be arrogant enough to say that we are not worth much because the purchase price was high indeed. It was the uniquely born Son, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. We're going, to we're going to continue studying the Levitical offerings next week, and I want to put together some more. I want to give you off. I just want to give you enough where you can actually bite it off and chew it and and assimilate it. If I give you too much of this at one time, it's just going to go through one ear and out the other. So next week, we're going to look at the gift offering in detail. We're going to look at the oven offering, the pan offering, and the frying pan offering. So I hope you can be back here for that. Let me pray with you, and we'll be dismissed. 
Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to be able to come together as Christians and be able to sup around the table of your word. I pray, Father, that this message might fall on ears that are hungry, maybe even starving, for the truth of your word. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 